Hello everyone and welcome to the Education Connections 12th webinar, Teachers as Advocates, Effective Practices for English Language Learners. We want to extend a warm welcome to everyone who's been able to join us for our third live event of the 2015-2016 school year. We're happy to see that some of the same familiar names of our Education Connections members as well as some new participants. We're so glad you could all join us. Thank you for taking the time to be with us this evening. We'll begin today's session with a brief introduction, including an overview of Education Connections. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Dejong. Following and throughout the presentation, we'll have some time for questions and comments from participants. We'll be monitoring questions as they come in and we encourage you to send along any thoughts or questions that come to mind during tonight's presentation using the question box in the GoToWebinar window. During today's session, we'll also be posting some polling questions related to both your background and today's topic. Once results are in, we'll post them for you to view. At the end of tonight's presentation, we'll have a Q&A and we'll briefly wrap up and remind you of ways to continue the conversation that we started tonight. We'll be doing some interactive activities throughout the webinar, but we also invite you to chat further about tonight's topic by joining us on Twitter. You can use the hashtag EdConnects, E-D-C-O-N-X, to participate in the conversation with Education Connection staff and your fellow educators. For those of you who may be new to Education Connections, we wanted to briefly introduce you to the community and the resources that are available. Education Connections is an initiative of the Center for Applied Linguistics in collaboration with the University of Oregon. It is hosted on the University of Oregon's OBAverse platform. Education Connections Connections is a free online community providing access to a wide range of resources and bringing together educators to collaborate around implementing high quality standards based instruction with all students, especially English learners. There are many different ways to participate in Education Connections. You can share ideas, ask questions in the discussion forums, find resources to use in your classroom, participate in live events such as this one and read Tuesday's tips and Friday's fun facts that are shared in the forums every week. Anyone is welcome to join so we invite you to sign up today if you're already not a member. In connection with tonight's webinar, the publisher of Dr. Dejong's book is offering a discount on 13 different books related to the education of English learners. These include Dr. Dejong Dejong's book, Foundations for Multilingualism in Education, From Principles to Practice, which equips pre-service and in-service educators with the knowledge and skills they need to make informed decisions about educating English learners. If you'd like to take advantage of this offer, simply go to the website listed on the screen. We'll also post the link in the chat box within the GoToWebinar, and the link is available on Education Connections under Live Events. To access an archived copy of tonight's webinar, please visit Education Connections, where a PDF, the video archive, and a link to resources will all be available. On your screen, we're going to begin the polling questions regarding your background. We'll post these results as they come in. So for tonight's first question, what is your current position, please click in the capacity that you currently work in. Great. It looks like we have 10% of general educator teachers, 40% of ELL or ESL teachers, and 40% of teacher educators, with 10% of our audience being ELL, ESL coordinators. On our second question today, we are wanting to know with what grade levels do you primarily work?
it looks like twelve percent of you are in the K through five grades, sixteen are in sixth through eighth grade, whereas twenty percent of you work in ninth through twelfth grade, twenty four percent of you pick the K through twelve category, and about twenty eight percent of you work in the college or university setting. Great. Well, at this time, we'll now turn it over to Dr. Dejong, who will begin her presentation, Teachers as Advocates, Effective Practices for English Language Learners. All right. Here we are. Can we hear me? Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the presentation. Um, I'm very pleased to have been invited by Education Connections to um, present on this um, particular topic that's dear to my heart. What I want to do today is um, really two things. One is I want to begin talking about um, why is it that advocacy is so important, particularly right now um, in this day and age. And the second piece will focus on how can we make decisions for English language learners that are informed by research and um, focus on what works for them in a way that is principled um, and can adjust and accommodate the different contexts in which we are working. And I will talk about four of those principles. One is the principle of equity, one that focuses on identity, one that focuses on language, and one that focuses on systems and how we put systems together. And for each one of those principles, we're going to look at teachers who made specific choices to align their practices with each one of these principles. So to begin with, I was wondering, when you hear the word advocacy, what is the first thing that comes to mind? Excellent. So I see that about 50% of you think about public policy, about 36 of you percent looking at advocacy as talking with a colleague, and 14% think about it in terms of attending local school board meetings. Of course, each one of those ways of engaging in advocacy are examples of advocacy. The idea that we're engaging public policy tends to be the one that we focus on first and foremost. We think of state legislature and being involved in this. What I want to focus on today is, in fact, that second one, that talking with a colleague in school or the things that we do in our classrooms are also what I would call acts of advocacy. They are ways that we can give voice to ELLs and engage in practices that will help them be successful in schools. So why is this so important? Um, I need you to help me forward the slides. Sure, give me one second, Esther. Sorry, we'll just work this out real quickly. No problem. OK, and I'm going to turn you back as the presenter. So it'll ask you again to become the presenter. Kidoki. There we go. So why is it that we need to focus on advocacy, particularly right now? I saw that many of you are either teacher educators or English language um, ESL teachers. And I think at being able to engage in advocacy in your roles is hugely important right now. And this is the reason why. Um, one of the things that has happened is that it used to be that bilingual teachers and specialist English as a second language teachers were seen as the people responsible for working with second language learners, right? They were the ones to take care of their language needs and their cultural needs and made sure that the students were prepared to go into the mainstream 
and the mainstream teacher kind of continued doing whatever it was that they were doing. Well, this day and age, many of our English language learners are not in specialized programs, but in fact, increasingly, we see them placed in mainstream classrooms. Um, a study showed that from 1993 to 2003, there was an increase of the number or the percentage of English language learners that received minimal or no special services from 32% to 50%. And this is almost 10 years old, so at this point in time, probably even more ELLs find themselves in a mainstream classroom. The reason why that's happening is partially because of straight enrollment. There's the number of ELLs and grows much faster than the general education population, and we can keep up, if you will, with the specialists. It also happens particularly in what we call new destination states, so those states that don't have a long history of ELL um, and immigration, such like we have in California or here in Florida. But places like Nevada and Georgia, North South Carolina, have seen over 200% increase in their ELL enrollments. And the first place where the students will go is going to be a mainstream classroom because these states typically don't have the infrastructure initially to support the ELL um, enrollment and placement. And so it makes sense for them to be placed in a mainstream classroom first. The other way that we see that ELLs are increasingly part of the mainstream is that in accountability systems like No Child Leave Left Behind, we have identified English language learners as a subgroup that we have to be held accountable for. Um, and that's a big shift from the past. So now we really do look at ELLs and their achievement patterns. And we're talking to schools and say, you know, how are your ELLs doing amidst all of the other groups of students that are also in your school? So that's a big shift to push the students and making them part of the mainstream classroom. Then last but not least is this notion of academic language. This has been part of the field of English as a second language and bilingual education for a long time, but now with Common Core, everybody talks about academic language, right? The discourse of math and the need for students to learn the specific language of science. All students now need to know that, and ELLs are now part of that mainstream. But this has not been a bad development. It's been very positive um, in many cases because now there is this more of a sense of a shared responsibility across the school or across the district that wasn't there before. And so more resources are put into the education of English language learners. And so that's a really important part. The other piece that I think is very important, and this is particularly to your, the teacher educators in the audience, that there is a national understanding that all teachers need to be prepared to work with English language learners. Um, they are in the classrooms, and so we need to prepare teachers. And that understanding or efforts to accomplish that really hasn't been there until um, more, more recently. So these are positive pieces that have helped um, with the mainstreaming of English language learners. There's also some concerns. Um, as we have moved English language learners into the mainstream, in some cases what happens is that the specific linguistic and cultural strengths and needs are kind of become invisible um, because ELLs are kind of subsumed under a big category of diversity. Sometimes they're put together with struggling readers. Sometimes we put them together with students with special needs. And although sometimes they may have some elements in common with these groups, they're not the same. And so it is important to continue to highlight some of the differences that come when we have English language learners, and particularly being able to identify the strengths and the richness that they bring when they come to school. The other phenomenon that we have seen is that as students go into the mainstream, there is a real question about what is the ELL-specific knowledge and skills that teachers need to know, and what is the place of the ESL teacher within that? And some of you may know that Candace Harper and I have done some writing and research on this idea that teaching English language learners is just good teaching. 
as long as teachers know how to work and do a good job with native English speakers, they will also know how to do a good job with second language learners. And we've said that sometimes that's the case, but it's not a sufficient piece. There are specific ELL knowledge and skills that we need to develop um, in teachers and with teachers. The other concern that I have is that if we are finding ELLs more and more in mainstream classrooms, the reality is still that most mainstream teachers are still unprepared or underprepared. So this is an interesting study by Valentine, Sandeman, and Levy who look nationwide to see how prepared are mainstream teachers. And so you can see that only 29.5% of teachers with ELLs actually had the training to effectively work with second language learners. Currently still one, less than one-sixth of the colleges that offer pre-service teacher preparation include training on working with ELL. So many teachers still graduate with certification um, that does not include working with second language learners. And in the other side, you can see that there's still a lot of need for continuing professional development. So although we have more ELLs connected to mainstream classrooms, the teachers themselves are still not um, well prepared to do so. So given both of these strengths, the just good teaching part and the fact that we don't have adequate preparation yet for mainstream teachers, I think it is becoming more and more important that we can advocate as specialists, in, in many of your cases, that we can advocate for informed decisions for second language learners in our classrooms. And I think this is important for all teachers, whether you are an ELL teacher, an ESL teacher, whether you are a bilingual teacher, or whether you are a mainstream teacher, because it becomes important for you to understand what are the effective practices for English language learners, why do we think they are effective and how can you advocate as a teacher for these practices in your school. And this brings me to a quote that has always struck me and has been so important. And that is one from Sonia Nieto saying that as educators, all decisions we make, no matter how neutral they may seem, have an impact on the lives and experiences of our students. This has always been a really profound quote for me because sometimes we think about the state policies and the big picture. But what Sonia Nieto points out is that even the smaller decisions that we might make, even though we think they don't matter, they will matter for our students. So give, think about the following example. What kind of signage do we put up for our students to see? Either is our signage multilingual? Is our signage in English only? When parents walk into the school, what do they see first? These are simple decisions, but they send an incredibly powerful message to parents and students, whether they belong in the school or not. Here's a more complicated example. Um, I was working with a teacher in Massachusetts. And Massachusetts, um, about a decade ago, passed um, what was called Question 2. Question 2 was an English-only law similar to the one that was passed in California a couple of years before that, Proposition 227. So Question 2 mandated that she use only English in her classroom as part of her sheltered English immersion classroom. Now, the teacher was one that had been part of a bilingual program for a long time and so really believed in bilingualism. And she really faced a dilemma. She's like, I know according to the law, I have to use English only. But I know how important bilingualism is for my students and for the parents that I have. And so what, what, what she did together with the administrators they looked very closely at the actual language of the law and tried to figure out, is there anything that we can do with the native language? And as they were reading, they realized that, those, that the law very specifically talked about basic materials used in the classroom, but it didn't say anything about homeschool communication. 
And so what the teacher decided to do was to make and put together bilingual book bags that she would send home so that the parents could read in the native language and support literacy practices at home. That was a hugely powerful decision that this teacher made in order to honor the bilingualism that she, she valued and yet also stay within the confines of the law. So these decisions matter. So it becomes important then that we contextualize, though, what advocacy can look like. I think of those in terms of spaces. And advocacy can happen in different spaces. It can look differently. And the kinds of things that we can do as advocates will differ depending on where we are. Some of you might be in school systems where there's a lot of prescriptive language and that you don't have a lot of variation as to what you can do as part of your curriculum. Others, you may have a lot of freedom as to what you do and how you do it. So your advocacy and the spaces that you can create to advocate for your ELLs will necessarily look different. And I think it's important to acknowledge that. Not that one is better than the other. So when Nancy Dubitz and I looked at bilingual teacher advocacy, we realized that some of the advocacy happens outside of the classroom. And that's this piece that we often think about first, like we had earlier in the poll. We think about the legislature and the way that we can engage with state or federal policy. We also sometimes look at it in terms of working with parents and organizations out in the community as part of the advocacy that we might engage in. But then we also realize that advocacy happens inside the classroom. And those consist of the pedagogical choices about curriculum instruction that we make and the kinds of medium of instruction or language choices that we make. What we're going to focus on for the rest of this evening is on this particular kind of advocacy. The advocacy that we can engage in in our classroom and that we can actually perform on a day-to-day -day basis. To help with that is thinking about teacher decisions along the lines of what works for second language learners. And there's lots of practices that work for second language learners. And again, as I said earlier, what you can do in terms of your practices will vary from context to context. So in the book, one of the things I'm trying to do is to say, well, regardless of context, whether you are in a bilingual program, whether you are in a mainstream program, whether you are an ESL teacher, the principles of effective schooling don't vary because we know from the research what works for second language learners. And so in the book, I talk about four principles. And the four principles are kind of a framework as kind of a touchstone for decision making. One is striving for equity. The other ones are affirming identities, promoting additive bilingualism, and structuring for integration. So what I want to do is to take you through each one of these. And I just want to have a little caveat here. Each one of these principles is like a full graduate level course in and by itself, right? So the format of the webinar won't allow me to go in depth in each one of them. So I'm just going to highlight the basic idea. We're going to talk a little bit about why it's so important. And I'm going to give you some examples of practices. And then a tool that would help you reflect on that particular principle. But this is by no mean int means intended as an in-depth, comprehensive piece, because it would take a lot longer to do that. So let's look at these four guiding principles. Right? This is where we're going to go. We're going to go through them one by one. The first one is educational equity. That's kind of the foundational part of what we're doing. That English language learners, as they're part of our school system, that we want to make sure that they are part of the system and yet that we don't discriminate systematically against them in the system. And that brings us to a very important distinction between equality and equity. And that's sometimes hard for other people to understand. I've had many conversations with mainstream teachers, and they say, well, but I need to do the same for English language learners 
as I do for all of my other students, because otherwise it's not fair. And then we have a long discussion about why doing the same thing is not always an equitable thing to do. And this comes out of a old law case that you're probably familiar with, 1974, Lau versus Nichols, a court case that happened in California with Chinese students whose parents said, well, by putting the students, our children, in an English medium classroom where everything is done in English, then our students don't have the same kind of access to instruction as the native English speakers have. And the Supreme Court agreed with them. They were very clear. It's like, no, it's not the same experience. If you get the same teacher and the same materials, but one student is a fluent English speaker and has full access to the instruction, and one student is a second language learner who is still in developing the language of instruction and therefore, by default, will not have the same kind of access. And so we need to do something different. And so the principle of educational equity walks this really fine balance between recognizing that difference needs to be acknowledged and embraced and recognized and affirmed. And yet at the same time, we cannot let the difference become something that we use to marginalize students. So it's a very fine line, but it's the core principle of what we do in education. The more formal way of saying that is that educators who apply the principle of educational equity create school environments where each individual feels valued and respected. It's a basic human right to be treated that way. They work together to ensure that formal and informal language policies and practices at the school, program, and classroom levels fairly represent the diversity in the school and do not discriminate systematically against certain groups of students. ELLs being only one of those groups of students, you have other groups of students that I'm sure that you can think about that would also, could also be affected by different policies. So this is the foundational part. The other three principles um, kind of follow that and kind of build on that, and so each one of these Additional principles go back to this idea of educational equity as we're implementing it. So the principle of affirming identities is the first one. It has a lot to do with culture. It has a lot to do with who we are. And the way that I frame that one in the book is to say that the principle of affirming identities has to do with validating diverse cultural experiences in school policy and classroom practices and that teachers purposefully create spaces for diverse student voices. Because each student will come to you with a different background, with a different experience, and it's really important that we start with affirming them for who they are. I mean, one of the most important things that one of my advisors told me is that we have to treat bilingual students as bilinguals, not as a monolingual, but as bilinguals. And the affirming identity piece recognizes that that's what the students come from. Why is this important? It's important because to give students a sense of belonging and that they are legitimate participants in the classroom is what will get them engaged. It will be what will propel them to learn and to learn more. And so without that, um, we're running the risk that they will tune out and that they will drop out. In practice, there's lots of things that we can do. Let's start with a very basic one, and that is get to know your students. I always have to, um, when I work with mainstream teachers, I always ask them, tell me about the languages in your, in your classroom. And oftentimes they say, oh, they don't know any other languages. I don't have any ELLs in my classroom. And then I say, well, did you ask? Did you ask the languages that your students either know or are exposed to? And it's like, well, no. I said, well, why don't you do a survey? Why don't you do a survey checking out what languages that they might be in contact with, whether it's at home, with grandparents, in the community? And I would say 10 out of 10 times, they will come back and say, I can't believe how many languages my students are in contact with. 
it's a basic question that we want to start asking our students, like tell me about who you are. And the next piece is to think about ways to create spaces for student voices and diverse perspectives. Not always an easy thing to do, especially if you have a mandated curriculum, but there are places and spaces that we can identify possibilities. Oops. Let me go back one over here. So here's one strategy. It comes out of Socorro Herrera's book, who says, when we want to get to know our students, we need to know them both in terms of the kinds of things that they know from a school perspective, what have they learned, what are the school-related skills, but then we also need to get to know them as people, and how do they view the world, how do they look at their own languages, and um, how do they identify themselves. And this is a nice little chart that she uses and that's available from the Teachers College Press website to get to know your student holistically, not just in one dimension. Another example comes out of um, Canada, where Thornwood Elementary School creates what they call identity texts. These are bilingual texts that students create. Thornwood is a um, multilingual school, so they cannot really do a bilingual program, but they create with the students these bilingual books and bilingual texts that they collaborate on um, in small groups. And the, probably the most powerful message that this work sends to the students, as one of the students was talking about it, it was saying that from the day one when the students come to school, they become a legitimate partner in this community and are being looked at and treated as full-fledged learners of the school. They don't have to wait till they have enough proficiency in English in order to participate and be treated as a full member um, in the school. So those are just two examples around getting to know your students and creating spaces and voices for the voices of the students. Here are some additional questions that you might think of if you want to reflect on this particular principle. And the way that I've kind of broken that down is by thinking of it in terms of your curriculum, thinking of it in terms of the kinds of pedagogy or the classroom interactions that you create as a teacher, and finally, the choices that you make in terms of the assessments, whether it's formative or summative assessment that you do with your students. We won't go through each one of these. It just gives you an, um, kind of a quick look and see the, of the kinds of activities, the kinds of questions that you might ask. But we are going to pick one of these and ask you to reflect on that in the next poll. Excellent. So most of you already feel good about the kinds of things that you do to reflect um, students' opportunities um, in your classroom for, for voices. Wonderful. So the next principle is the principle of promoting additive bilingualism. This principle comes back in terms of how do we treat and value students' native languages in our classrooms and in our schools? And do we give those different languages a place as we are teaching? Now, the importance of bilingualism these day, this day and age, you see this everywhere. Um, you can see it in the newspaper, you can see it um, referenced in terms of the kinds of benefits that we are finding that are linked to bilingualism, whether the cognitive benefits, you may have read about um, Bialystok's research that um, shows that if you use two languages on a regular basis in adulthood, um, that it may postpone um, dementia with a couple of years. We know about the positive impact of bilingual education 
It's also important because by additive bilingualism, building on the student language is simply a good learning principle. As teachers, we build on what students know. And for many bilingual students, that learning is and has happened in other languages. And so to use that language as a, as a resource and a springboard for teaching makes a lot of sense. It's also important to communicate to our students that learning does happen in many other languages. We're in the United States. A lot of learning happens in English. But it certainly is not the only language in which learning can take place. And that speaking a language other than English is not a deficit. It's simply you speak a language other than English, and you are learning English. So we can look at this as a resource. Now, you might say, but wait a minute. Isn't additive bilingualism something that bilingual programs do? And I would say, no, it's not. Because this principle of additive bilingualism is something that is true no matter what your context is. Now, what you can do may differ, right? So the principle of additive bilingualism is important because it's a general principle. But in some of your contexts, you may be able to implement a full-fledged dual language program. And the goal is bilingualism and biliteracy. In other contexts, you might have multiple languages. And so a bilingual program is not possible. But then you can still think about bilingual resources and instructional practices that support additive bilingualism. And so I would argue that an additive bilingual stance is always possible. And because of the importance of bilingualism, it's important that we keep thinking about how can we do that, even if, even if we are ourselves monolingual teachers. What can we still do to support the notion that the native language or languages other than English are a resource. So here's one way of thinking about this. Besides allowing students to use their native language, we can use bilingual books. Bilingual books are great tools for students to do preview and learn information about a particular topic that you might be talking about in English. It's a great opportunity for maybe one student to read something in one language and the other student to read it in the other language. There's lots of tools that you can use just by using bilingual books and making sure that your classroom library and the school library reflect multiple languages. In order to encourage students to kind of think through the different languages and realize that we use two languages, and that sometimes we code switch. We begin in one language, and then we follow up with another language. But that's a very natural thing to do. But if you have choose literature that actually uses that, it allows you to have a conversation about these daily practices that bilingual learners see all around them and engage in themselves. Lastly, one of the things to think about is how can we use assessments that allow us to see what a student can do, not only in and through English, but also in and through their native language. And probably one of the most powerful examples that I've seen of this is done by Kathy Escamilla at um, University of Colorado in Boulder. They developed a program called Literacy Squared. And they very intentionally try to figure out how can we demonstrate what students know in the two languages that they speak. And so this is just one part of their assessment. But you can see that they're having an English score and a Spanish score next to one another. And so you can see that even if a student might score a 2, beginning writer, one idea, they may score a 7 in Spanish. And it tells you a lot about the literacy skills that the students have. The other thing that they do in their um, assessment is that they very intentionally identify what they call bilingual strategies. So as the students is using their native language, Spanish in this case, to figure out English, you're going to see transfer from one language to the other, and sometimes the other way around, if it happens to be a writing sample in Spanish. And what they do here, they look at this as creative language use. It's not a problem that they code switch, right? 
but it is a creative strategy that shows the awareness that students have about the two languages. So those are two examples of practices. Now again, let's reflect on what are some possible questions that we could ask ourselves to think about our practices related to curriculum, pedagogy, and assessment that would reflect this particular principle of promoting additive bilingualism or multilingualism. And again, I won't read all three of them. We're going to pick one of the questions and we're going to give you a poll to reflect on this particular principle. Excellent. So it looks like 38% um, strongly agree um, that you use um, that they use that students use their bilingualism. It would be great to hear some of the strategies that you are using to use that bilingualism for for, for learning, um, because those are important strategies not only for you to use but also to work with mainstream teachers. Um, to use as well as if you are a teacher educator and you prepare mainstream teachers, how can you help your pre-surface teachers understand how to do that? So this is great. So our last principle is the principle of structuring for integration. And structuring for integration has to do with realizing that in schools and in classrooms we have many different pieces that are coming together. And our challenge is to make one coherent system out of those different pieces, but do that in such a way that doesn't marginalize any one of the pieces. And so being able to think of schools and classrooms as inclusive environments where different parts have an equal status is kind of what this principle is trying to get to. The reason why this structuring for integration is so important goes back to when I was talking earlier about equity. It is easy to segregate students in a special program with the result that they and their teachers and the curriculum is marginalized and that we have different expectations for these students than we have for other students. It's also true that simply placing English language learners in a mainstream classroom without the mainstream classroom truly changing how we do things make equally marginalized the student in the mainstream classroom. So marginalization can happen either by simply putting students in a classroom, like a mainstream classroom, or it can happen when we segregate them in a separate classroom. And so what Structuring for Integration is trying to do is to say we need to figure out how to bring the different pieces together. ELLs need to be connected with other students in the school. But how can we do that in a way that rec recognizes their strengths and their needs in an explicit way? And I just like Winnie the Pooh there um, to recognize that we are different and yet we have a lot in common as well. And so what can that look like? One of the ways that one school thought about this was saying, we value bilingualism as a school. We have a, this particular school had a bilingual program in the school, but the rest of the school was just English medium, general education. But the value of the entire school was bilingualism. So the kinds of things that they did to integrate this value in practice was that they made sure that bilingual personnel were present throughout the school, not only as it was connected to the bilingual program. They had Spanish materials in all the classrooms, not just the bilingual classrooms. They hired a bilingual secretary because they realized that the bilingual secretary can talk to all parents and children and not just to one segment of the population. 
And then they established an exchange program with Japanese teachers because they felt it was important to expand everybody's horizons with different languages and cultures. So they did this for the whole school, and that made a lot of sense for them in terms of integration. Another part that I would encourage us to think about in terms of integration is the notion of cooperative learning. We know how important cooperative learning is for second language learning. We know it's really important for them to um, have the opportunity to interact with more fluent English speakers in order to use the language. We know cooperative learning is very important also for conceptual development, right? Now, the notion of structuring for integration asks the question, well, how do we structure our cooperative learning activities in such a way that all of the students have meaningful ways of connecting to the content? What happens a lot, unfortunately, and I'm sure many of you have seen this, is that we walk into a classroom and we see a cooperative learning activity, and who is the student who is speaking? It's the fluent English speaker. Because the classroom has not been set up to make sure that even the English language learner, who is still at the beginning levels of second language development, can also participate. So the principle of structuring for integration really challenges us to think about how to have each student make these meaningful contributions, regardless of how we structure the class. So here are some other questions that we can think about in terms of reflecting on the principle of structuring for integration. And we're going to do the same thing. Again, they were kind of uh, laid out for curriculum, pedagogy, and assessment. And we're going to ask you one of the questions to, um, as part of our poll for tonight. Nice. So I see that 62% of you agree with this, and I, I applaud you for being able to not only do assessments for academic purposes and for language purposes, but that you can also think about and have space to think about social cultural outcomes and building, um, for example, cross-cultural competence um, as part of your curriculum for your second language learners. So I hope that um, just by going through these principles and go through them pretty quickly without um, being able to spend a lot of time with each one of them, that it gave you a sense that these principles are useful to help us think about practices and the decisions that we make in terms of practices at the school level, in terms of our curriculum, in terms of our pedagogy and how we structure our classes, and in terms of the assessment practices that we engage in. And so to just kind of conclude with this, that this notion of teachers as advocates, these are the decisions that we make. And I would almost say, like, with, like Alistair Pennicook does right here, is that we are policy makers in our classroom. We make decisions about how we run things when it comes to our curriculum choices, our classroom organization, our pedagogy, or our assessment choices. And as um, the principles show, we have a lot of flexibility then to think about the decisions that we make and the extent to which they are aligned to the four principles that I've just lined, outlined for, for tonight. So I think our goal in the end depending on where your practices are, is to find big and small, if you will, implementation spaces and use these spaces to work towards an increased alignment of our practices and that of others. Some of you may be working with mainstream teachers whose practices are not where your practices are. Some of you might be in teacher preparation programs where there's a little bit of attention to second language learners, but it really needs to be 
much more in order to um, develop teachers who can, in fact, align their practices to these four principles. And then last but not least, I just wanted to re-emphasize how important our decisions are on a day-to-day -day basis. Teachers are advocates and can advocate on a daily basis for English language learners by thinking carefully about the decisions that we make, about what we teach, how we teach, and how we interact with our students and colleagues and the various caregivers and community members. Those decisions, like Sonia Nieto said earlier, they matter. They matter greatly for ELLs and the quality of experiences that we provide them so that they too can be successful in our classrooms and in our schools. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Dejong. We only have a few minutes for questions, but we'll go ahead and take some of the ones that came in during tonight's presentation. The first one comes from a woman named Sophia who asked, how can we advocate for ELL training for mainstream teachers when the ELL population is low within the school district? That's a great question. Can you still hear me? Yes? Oh, okay. Just making sure. I think that's a great question because sometimes when you have a small population, it is harder to convince others that you need that um, professional preparation. Sometimes the starting point is with that one or two teachers who do have the ELLs in their classroom. And I think in a lot of cases what you see, and this might be part of what your experience is, Sylvia, that you become the coach for the mainstream teacher. You become the co-teacher for the mainstream teacher. And so sometimes the professional development starts small as you work with a mainstream teacher. Um, and from that, hopefully, you can build a broader approach to professional development. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for that answer, Dr. Dejong. Another question that came in had to do with assessment, and particularly how can teachers assess students when the students speak a different language than the teacher or anybody else within the school district? That's also a very good question. So here's one thing that um, you might do. Um, as it was recommended to me by, by a colleague of mine, if you were to ask the students to write something in their native language, and just I'd like a free write, you will already get a sense of their understanding of literacy. Do they, are they able to write in a certain, what's the directional um, use of the language? Can they put together a paragraph? Um, how fluent do they seem to be as they are writing in their native language? Um, this day and age, many people also use different applications, computer applications to help with accessing the native language. Um, so that might be another strategy that you can use if you have nobody else in the system that helps you, um, that can help you through the native, native language um, assessment. And then I think the other piece that's really important is that if the assessment has to happen in English, which may well be the case, that we think about are we allowing the student to demonstrate what they know then in English and to think about the accommodations and the scaffolding that we might need to do depending on the proficiency level of the student then becomes a really important strategy um, so that we don't expect students to write um, or produce and the amount of language that they're not ready for yet, that we provide the scaffolds, whether it's a graphic organizer or a sentence frame or a paragraph frame to scaffold their language, but that you as a teacher can really figure out to the best of your ability what the student is able to do, um, whether it's in English or in the native language. 
Good, good. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Zhejiang, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation tonight. The comments that have been coming in have been overwhelmingly positive, and it's been very enjoyable to hear. Um, as we're getting close to the end of our time, though, I just want to remind people that Dr. Dejong's book is currently available at a nice discount on the Caslon website. If you look on the chat box, you see the link where you can click and receive that book among 10 or so other books available for almost a 40% discount. So I highly recommend you log online and check that out. And again, I want to thank everybody for joining us. If you have any questions about tonight's presentation or education connections overall, please feel free to reach out to us at edconnect.cal.org edconnect or call us toll free at 1-866-715-0286. You're also able to join us and join the discussion here on Education Connections at www.obaverse.net slash edconnect. Um, once again, thank you so much for joining us from the Education Connections team, and thank you again to Dr. Dejong for an excellent presentation. Thank you.